afraid, like the um, Porsche ambassador, I'm stuck in the 20th century, so you won't get um, any PowerPoint from me, I'm afraid. Um, but um, <coughs> the same time, read the first rule of good teaching, as I understand it, and um, start with uh, two anecdotes and a reading. The first anecdote, and my subject is, is of course, how Russia deals with Europe. There's an old Chinese saying that the best approach to any target is to circle from afar. I'm going to start a long way off, but little luck I'll get there. When Vladimir Putin first met Angela Merkel, he had a brief, he's always well briefed, that she disliked dogs. She came into his formal room in his residence outside Moscow, and within seconds, his favorite Labrador, Connie, Connie came in and nuzzled Mrs. Merkel's knee. That's number one. Number two, last year, about March, the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov came to Australia. He was en route to the South Pacific. And um, the then Australian Prime Minister, Kevin Australian Foreign Minister, Kevin Rudd, had a formal dinner for him in the Sydney Opera House. 20 or 30 guests. Beforehand, there was uh, in proper diplomatic practice, a coup de champagne. Mr. Rudd, Mr. Lavrov, Mr. Lavrov is out, offered a glass of champagne. Kevin Rudd takes a glass of champagne. Lavrov says, I would prefer whiskey. So the waiter is about to go, and Rudd puts his champagne glass back and says, I think I'll have a whiskey too. The waiter goes out and comes back, two glasses of whiskey on the rocks. Lavrov says, without ice. That's that? Oh, I think I'll have <laughs> <laughs> So the waiter goes out again, comes back, whiskey without ice. And Lavrov says, I like soda water with my whiskey. And Rudd says, oh, I can't have soda. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and finally, that's, that's an anecdote for you. The Russian style of diplomacy. And I, even though I have a very high regard for Kevin Rudd as a prime minister and as a diplomat, the way he fell into that crude trap makes me scared. Finally, this is a conversation. Tasmania, yes, they have been there. My new friend was a slightly inebriated middle-aged man called Igor, who had insisted I join him and his pal Boris at their table in the cozy cabin bar on the fourth floor of the hotel, the only floor with plenty of hot water. I am ethnologist, he said, so I have seen all those pygmies and crocodiles of yours in Tasman. <laughs> very interesting. It was already a very Russian sort of conversation. What do you do? I'm a writer. Ah. Do you have any great writers in Australia? <laughs> <laughs> well, I said, without wanting to be too postmodern about what great means, yeah, well, we have um, Patrick White, for instance. I thought of mentioning Helen Garner, but decided against it under the surface. <laughs> I have never heard of him, said Igor quaffing an alarming amount of vodka from his glass in one gulp. Have you, Barrier? Boris hasn't heard of white either. You see, the trouble with your country <laughs> is there are no great Australians. Can you name one great Australians? <laughs> Don Bradman, who I wouldn't do. <laughs> Nor would Kylie Minogue. <laughs> Well, I began hoping some suitable name would pop into my head, but strangely enough, my mind was a blank. <laughs> Surely someone in our history had been great. In the Russia, we have lots of great writers, great poets, great scientists, and great ethnologists. 
My grandfather was a prince, by the way. Do you have princes? <laughs> Well, no, not as such, I said. Sh should I mention our Mary in <laughs> This used to be a great country, Igor went on, with Maurice nodding sagely on the sidelines. A very great and mighty country. And now it is all in ruins. <clears throat> now I have to get a visa to visit my own brother in Kiev. <laughs> At this point, he fell sound asleep. He slumped sideways at a dangerous angle in his chair. But he has pulled him upright, murmuring tenderly in his ear. The most powerful nation on earth! <laughs> Igor said suddenly, returning with a burst of lucidity to the fray. You cannot say that about us, then. <laughs> no, you can't, I agreed. But do you think you're happier now than before. Before the collapse? No. What is there to feel happy about? We were great, we were powerful. Now I have to get visa to visit my own brother in Kiev. <laughs> so I wanted to start with that because what we're dealing with here today is, is the Russian approach to international relations. And if you ask Russians to try to sum up their own country in one word, you'll get various Responses. A common one is feudal. Uh, another is the Russian word krainosti, which means taking everything to extremes. But the most common one in my experience is the word vilikaya. Russia is a great country. It's not an ordinary country. It can't be measured by ordinary measurements. <coughs> what does greatness consist in? How would you define greatness? Well, Russians would say that they are a great power. And here we come back to the very interesting question of the language, because in Russian, the word for great power is Vinita Dzirzhava. And Dzirzhava is a word which comes from the verb to seize. Dzirzhivo. Seize it. A great power is a power which has the ability to seize other countries and to hold them. Dirjat, that's what it means. So there's that notion of a great power. And in the Russian mind, I would submit to you, there are two types of countries. There are great countries, and there are the rest. There's an old Irish folk song that says, it was England bade our wild geese go, that small nations might be free. The notion that small nations have a right to freedom clashes with the Russian notion which says that great powers have a right to influence the countries around them to, to secure their own legitimate security. There's an old Russian saying that says, the only secure border has Russian soldiers on both sides. <laughs> <laughs> Many Russians today feel the loss of empire very sorely, as I think the British probably did in their time, and other imperial peoples. Many find it very hard to accept that the Soviet Union fell apart, not because of some CIA plot, because of its own internal contradictions, which I think were set out for us very well just now. Someone is to blame, and it ain't us. This notion of great powers is, I think, crucial in understanding Russian foreign policy to anyone, to the United States, to China, India, or to Europe. Um, Second point, we had a very good introduction this morning to who is Vladimir Putin. Well, Vladimir Putin is many things. I think he's a formidable fellow. I think he's a very talented fellow. I don't like to sound patronizing. Um, there was only one factual error that I could see in Teresa's terrific presentation, and that had him KGB officer from 1992. He was KGB officer from the 1970s. He was what they call a walk-in. 
On three occasions, Vladimir Putin tried to join the KGB. On two occasions, he was told, we don't take warnings. But in the end, he joined the KGB. And he became a formidable martial artist. And he was well trained in mind control and in memory. He's got a photographic memory. And he's very good at dealing with people. He can change. And the way he charmed George Bush was a bit like Love Robin, Kevin Rudd. When you met George Bush, he was wearing crucifix. And George says, I see you're wearing a crucifix there, Vladimir. He said, yes, I want to tell you a story about that. Many years ago, I had a small dacha outside Leningrad. It caught fire. I was able to save. My wife was away at the time. My two daughters were there. I saved them. The following morning, I looked in the ruins, and there I found this crucifix, which belonged to my mother. And I've worn it ever since. And George Bush came away from that meeting saying, I've looked him in the eye and seen his soul. Boy, <laughs> 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 give me a break. Um, so Mr. Putin is a KGB officer. Very important to understand the different distinction between the KGB, the CIA, and say, ASIO or ASIS. The KGB is a military organization. You are a KGB officer. You have a right to bear arms. And when Putin met the now Chancellor of the ANU, Gareth Evans, in 1992, <laughs> and Evans said to him, what's your background, Mr. Putin? He said, I'm a military man. And Gareth said to him, would you mind telling me what branch of the military? I'm not at liberty to say, he said. But the point about the military is this. Any one of you, any of you who have dealt with the Department of Defense will know. And as the Polish ambassador was saying, there's something about the military mindset. And one of the things about the military mindset is there's a technical solution to any problem. The diplomat will tell you very often there's no technical solution. The only solution, the technical solution, of course, includes war. And the diplomat will tell you, no, we need a negotiation. Traditionally, Russia as an imperial power has placed great emphasis on military might. Even today, they have a million strong army. Russia has conscription. You might say to you, well, so does Finland, and so does <coughs> Switzerland, but I don't think the Baltic states are terribly worried about the Finns. Um, <laughs> nor are their neighbors very worried about the Swiss. But you have history teachers that you have a right if you're the Estonians to be concerned about the Russians. And you have a right to join NATO. If I were Estonian, I would have been bashing on the door to get into NATO. To this day, Russia has 184,000 internal army just to keep the peace. So the Czechist military view, the KGB view, the Russian view is you have to be strong. Because if you're not strong, you'll get beaten. Someone will oppress you. And what really matters in this world is there's three great powers. And Russia should be one of them. US, China, and Russia. And Mr. Putin came to power with a promise that he would restore Russia to greatness. But this <coughs> of course, he has kept his promise. You don't need friends. Alexander III once famously said Russia doesn't need friends when it has its army and its navy. And Putin loves to quote Palmerston on the fact that countries have no permanent friends, only permanent interests. That really appeals to him. So it's against, really, that background that we look at how Russia deals with Europe. The Russian, one of the speakers today mentioned the Westphalian notion of diplomacy. One of these notions of 19th century diplomacy was that countries had legitimate spheres of interest. And Mr. Medvedev, when he was president, said that Russia has a sphere of privileged interest. What this really means is that Russia has a legitimate right to influence the policies of the countries on its periphery if those policies impinge on Russian interests. And this is where you come up against a fundamental values clash between Russia on the one hand and Europe on the other. Russia stands for sovereignty of a great state. 
and the right to, let's not say interfere, to influence the policies of the states around it, be it Georgia or Moldova, or perhaps Poland, or Kazakhstan. Obviously, with the Chinese, they're a bit too big to push around, so we'll leave them aside. Um, and the European Union, of course, stands for groups of countries coming together, small countries, banding together to seek non-violent diplomatic solutions. If you look at Russian policy, you'll find that generally, unlike a small country like Australia, relatively small, they don't even give a tinker's curse about multilateral organizations. The G20, you know, the East Asia Summit. Too many countries, and they've all got the same power. An effective multilateral organization has a small number of countries, countries that can actually achieve something. Not bootling little countries that chatter on about their rights. That's why Mr. Putin doesn't like to go to these meetings. He considers them a waste of time. So I would say to you that the core instincts of this man and the group of people around him, the number two man in Russia, Mr. Sechin, he's effectively number two, served with the Russian military intelligence in Angola. He actually had a, a military role. He fought in the civil war in Angola. Uh, he's also a very talented, very effective man. But he shares with Putin this view that ultimately power comes from the barrel of a gun or from a Swiss bank account. And they would agree with Stalin. Very quotable, Mr. Stalin, who famously said, how many divisions has the world? You could argue that's an outmoded notion of power, but that's the notion they have. So I would say their core instincts are primacy of hard power, a strong sense of exceptionalism, and a sense of, a sense of strategic entitlement. Well, that essentially brings us to Europe. For Moscow, Europe is really a set of small countries in decline. Whereas Moscow has said that the, the wind of geopolitics is back in Russia's sails. And they have reason to think that way because Russia has between 6 and 25% of the globe's resources of almost everything. The exceptions of bauxite, rare earths, and uranium. They've got the rest. And if you know that fossil fuels are going to drive the world economy for some decades yet, and you're sitting on them, and the, the, big, the biggest international companies like ExxonMobil have to come to you to do a deal, then I think you've got a right to feel fairly confident that Russia may have its problems. But by comparison to, say, Europe, we're doing pretty well, thank you. It's quite clear when you look at Russian policy, they don't like to deal with Brussels. Better to divide and conquer. Pick the individual countries and try them, try to induce them by whatever means to do what you want them to do. So in the case of Germany, clearly the most important country in Europe, you buy Mr. Schröder, the former <laughs> chancellor, and you make him the head of a new company which will build an oil pipeline through the Baltic, which will mean you'll be able to export your oil directly to Germany, your biggest market, Avoiding Ukraine and <coughs> Poland and not having to pay, thank you, not having to pay any royalties. From Russia, from Moscow's viewpoint, if you think about it, that makes good sense. You don't want your strategic assets going through countries like Ukraine and Poland that may get beyond your control. Better to have a direct line through the Baltic to Germany. Russia also makes takes a focus on France and plays very, very well. French notions of French glory. And of course, have just had a very significant victory by persuading Mr. Deperdieu to come and be the Minister of Culture of Mardoya, which is a province famous for its gulags. That's what you've got. So he's done very well there. That's a terrific coup, I would have thought. Fundamental problem is the values gap. The EU, as we've heard today, stands for certain values. Russia does not stand for those values. Russia stands for other values. 
it's not my job to say which set of values is more valid. But that they are different, you can be absolutely sure, and you saw it very graphically in the case of the Pussy Riot affair, where most Russians thought they got off lightly. Yeah. Most Russians believed they should have been punished much more severely than they were, whereas the bulk of Western public opinion was horrifying. Come on, they went to a church for 30 or 40 seconds and staged, come on. Anyway, only 6% of Russians attend church. Attend. So, it seemed to me that encapsulated the difficulties of this relationship. And looking down the track, I think one can't be too optimistic about relations between Russia and Europe because of that values gap. It may change over time. As you know, most Russians, in fact, prefer to have their holidays in Europe and to have their children educated in Europe and to have their money in a Swiss bank account or English bank account, anywhere but in Russia. Because in Russia, the Kremlin can come along and take it. So I'm not optimistic about those futures. And I think probably the most likely scenario of relations between Europe and Russia is sort of a mutually assured stagnation because of the values gap. They'll continue to trade. But if you actually look at the figures, the trade is nowhere near as substantial as you might expect. Energy will, of course, continue to be absolutely crucial. Um, I think that's the last of the points I wanted to make to you. Oh, yeah, just one final one. <coughs> and that's this notion of Russian exceptionalism. That we're different. We're not Europe, we're not Asia, we're Russia. And we are different. And there's a very famous quote, which I have here somewhere, from the Russian writer Gogol, where he actually, and the Russians love this quote. No, brothers, to love as the Russian soul can love. To love with all one's mind and all one's body, with everything that God gave us. No, no one else can love like that. Only we Russians have that passion. <laughs> Another saying that goes with it, the Germans make good suitcases. <laughs> and the gist is here that there's much to admire in Germany, much to emulate in Germany, obviously. But ultimately, the Germans are a banal, earthbound people, while we Russians, we aim for So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, both presenters again for a uh, very interesting and stimulating uh, thoughts that they've shared with us. Questions, comments? Uh, where's my comments? Oh, there they are. Um, I've got one for each, actually. Um, um, basically, uh, so just with, um, especially just the last half of what you were talking about there uh, with the current, the, um, current situation and stagnation, can you uh, provide a list of um, resources or, or books that, that are possibly out there to, uh, to read, look at for what that information? Uh, basically, right from back, you know, say from, um, yeah, I just found it fascinating and also very positive but also very scary as well. Um, but I'm just talking about because when I did say earlier on, that I believe that Russia is, in is integral to the peace of the Middle East. Um, but, but basically, um, what you've been saying for the last 10 minutes, very fascinating. Uh, I'd just like to um, know where to, to get some of those resources from to read about that, um, if that's OK. Sure. Uh, yeah, I... Uh, but there was a lot of... There's also... I don't know, I'm still processing it. So a lot of the things that, that, that were said... Well, I wouldn't want to sound too negative. Um, but it was as the Russians would say, but things could be a lot worse. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Someone has pointed out that in, in Russian terms, Mr. Putin is almost a liberal. In Russian terms. <laughs> yeah. um, and some of the people around him, like the ex-ambassador to NATO in Brussels, Mr. Ragosin, who's now the defense minister, He's really scary. Yeah. Because he's completely cynical. 
and ambitious. So but things could be far worse in Russia, and I happen to agree with you on the Middle East. The Russians like to say, it's somewhat of an exaggeration, that no global problem can be solved without them. Well, very often they actually don't want to take part. No. Once they've got a seat at the head table, sometimes they don't even turn up um, because they're in the club. But um, I think in the case of the Middle East, uh, Russian involvement, I think it's recognized Russian involvement is crucial. I actually brought along a list of books. I was thinking I was going to be speaking to secondary school teachers. I wasn't quite sure where to pitch the remarks. Um, but I brought along a list which I'll leave with Bridget Thank you. of books I think are good reading, you know, and well worth reading. And I later thought, how anti diluvian of me, I haven't given you websites when I gave you books. Mm -hmm. And um, the, if I had to recommend one website on Russia, it would be Der Spiegel. Oh, really? Yeah. Why is they've that? Got, they've got an excellent English a website. Thing. And I think, because you see, the Germans have a very nuanced policy towards Russia. Because of their, the historic legacy of their relations with Russia, the Germans contort themselves to be fair to the Russians. The United States sees no reason to be fair to the Russians. Certainly the British see no reason to be fair to the Russians. Um, and the Russians would complain to you bitterly that they get a very biased, unbalanced, prejudiced press in the West. Well, you can't say that about their Spiegel. Um, so I was thinking if I could recommend only one site to someone who wants to cover what's happening in Russia and get thoughtful, reflective commentary, which is actually trying very hard to be fair to the Russians, then I can only agree. The, the Guardian is very good. The, 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 the English Guardian is very good. Um, and the Spiegel is, is, is really excellent. But I'll leave the list of books yeah, good. with um, Bridget and ask her to copy them for everyone. And just on a secondary one, but with the uh, rug, the, the, the feelings of the uh, I mean, I haven't dealt with many Russians, but the way, uh, the, while I have learned with dealing with, with, with Russians and, and for respect and things like that, that what Rudd did, and, and I won't go on to that, Rudd, but wouldn't that, that, that transaction, that there, that would that that person that was that, that politician um, would look on him a, as being lower than a like lower than a dog basically. Oh, I don't think so. Um, I suspect you know, Lavrov is a real professional. Um, but that's what I'm saying. He's, is he's that to bring a person down to there, I would say. But he walked him. Yeah, he outsmarted him. Oh, it was a brilliant move. How it was an brilliant move. But there would be no way to counteract that. Yeah, I, I, I just, I, I don't know Lovrov personally, I've followed his career.